Hello, friends. It's time for the second hour of Open Line with Dr. Michael wright Elman. It's Moody Radio's Bible study across America, and we're talking about your questions about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. My name is Michael wright Elman. I'm the academic dean at Moody Bible Institute, also a professor of Jewish studies and Bible right here. We're live today, sitting around the radio kitchen table right here in Chicago, taking your questions from all across the country. So give me a call. The phone number is 877-548-3675. That's 877-548-3675. Remember, if you can't call, just go to our website, openlineradio.org. Click on the Ask Michael a Question link and you'll be able to fill out a form, put your question there. Trish will put it in the mailbag. I hope you have your Bibles open, and you really do need a second cup of coffee to stay awake. <laughs> and we're ready to talk about the Scriptures. I wanted to mention something about our trip. Uh, it was a fantastic trip. I was away for two weeks. We went to uh, Athens and Corinth, then got on a ship and went to various islands like Patmos. That was not so much about the Apostle Paul, but uh, Revelation and John. And we went to uh, Ephesus. We went to Pergamum. Uh, we went to Philippi, Thessalonica. It was phenomenal uh, seeing those places and seeing the Bible come alive from the journeys of Paul for the most part. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, we went on to, for an extension for most of the group, about two-thirds of the group went on to Rome. And I think it was uh, in the Jewish quarter of Rome that I had a most interesting experience. I was teaching about the history of the Jewish people of Rome from ancient times. I had to do it in about 10 minutes. Uh, ancient times right up until today, including the Holocaust. And when I was talking about that, at the end, I talked about God's heart for the Jewish people in Romans 11, 28 and 29, that though opposed to the gospel, Jewish people remain chosen and beloved according to Paul, and also that God's calling of them and the gifts he gave the Jewish people, like the gift of the land, the gift of the covenants, all those still belong to the Jewish people because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And while I was talking about that, there were many, many Jewish people looking at the Jewish quarter. Uh, a very observant Jewish man and his wife came and stood right in the midst of my group and wanted to hear what I was saying. Afterwards, he wanted to know, what group is this? And I said, well, it's a group of people who love Moody Bible Institute and want to learn about the Bible, and I'm a professor at Moody Bible Institute. He said, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago? Yeah. And then he said, well, why would a Christian school care about the Jewish people? And I said, because... We are followers of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And because of that, we care about his promises to the Jewish people. In fact, I told him about the summit opposing anti-Semitism, that Moody Bible Institute has a long history, a legacy of always opposing anti-Semitism because we love the king of the Jewish people and we want to see his heart for them. And so we're having the summit opposing anti-Semitism on November 9th right here at Moody Bible Institute. He was just amazed that, and I think it's a really good testimony to our Jewish friends, that this is really where we stand at Moody Bible Institute. I hope you'll want to come and learn how to oppose anti-Semitism as a follower of Jesus. Please join us on November 9th in Tory Gray Auditorium right here at Moody Bible Institute. We have wonderful speakers. Uh, it'll be just a, a great uh, event. So check it out. Go to openlineradio.org and click on the link about the summit opposing anti-Semitism and then join us on November 9th. And we're going to go to the phones right now. Uh, Renee in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida, listening on WRMB. Welcome to Open Line, Renee. How can I help you today? Well, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Did I say your name right? Um, I, I know you're a man, but is it still Renee? Yes, it's Renee. That's yeah. Right. Is that a, you. Are you French? No, no. Actually, Mom loved the name. The name actually, um, the etymology of the name is actually born again. Oh, you really? Guys, you got to love that. So, Mom. Well, I've Mom only met men that. named Rene if they were from France or like Montreal or places like that. So, that's interesting. One other quick thing. Um, the name Rene is actually a masculine name. If you look it up everywhere else in the world, it's actually considered a very masculine name, except in America where we add an extra E and everybody thinks it's female. So, I you know, see. There you go. Well, no, I, I know it's a masculine name, but 
uh, only yeah. uh, only French people, French speakers, have I met that you uh, use it as a man's name. But I, it's okay. I, I know you're a man. I just want to make sure I was saying it right. So <laughs> that's that's okay. That's okay. Um, I so appreciate your time and uh, just taking my call right now. Actually, been walking with the Lord, uh, born again Christian for 24 plus years, give wow. or take. Um, my question is really, um, I'm a strong believer in the pre-tribulation rapture. But um, I also have a question. Uh, you know, I've, I've been coming across some pretty learned PhD doctors in, you know, in the faith as well, Dr. Michael Heiser, so on and so forth, that are talking about a pre-wrath, which is right around the midpoint rapture. And I wanted, to, and they were saying, you know, it, it's chronological if you follow Matthew 24, and it's very plain to see. And the pre-trib rapture is not biblical. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to get your point, uh, your viewpoint on that as well, sir. Sure. Well. Uh, first of all, uh, as as someone with a doctorate, having a doctorate doesn't mean you know everything. Just so you know, uh, sure. you know, I, I am I am the, the people ask me about my doctorate. I say the doctorate's the last aspect of Western torture. Keep your hand in the fire long enough, and they'll they'll give you a doctorate. Uh, I had a professor that used to say anyone can get a doctorate if you can endure the boredom, and so I agree with that. And uh, so I'm not. You know, I guess maybe because I live among PhDs here, uh, that that's not always uh, the sign of being right. Just so you know, even for me, I'm saying the same thing about me. You know, uh, there are people. Let me let me tell you, there are a lot of people who disagree with things I say on this, and they they let me know uh, very plainly. So that's fine. Uh, I still believe in the preacher of rapture, having read Matthew 24 many times. Uh, the people who read it chronologically that hold to the preacher of rapture, when they read the uh, verses in verse 42, uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 40 through 42, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Many preacher of rapturists do not take that as the rapture. They take that as referring to being taken away to judgment. So that's a possibility. But I don't think that's the answer. I believe when you look at the question, verse 3, he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples approached him privately and said, tell us, when will these things happen? Mm. First question is when. Let's call it question A, when. Then question B, and what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Question B is signs. Question A is when. Uh, Question A when will these things happen? Question B, what are the signs? Okay? So, right. so A, B. When you look at the answer the Lord Jesus gives, right, he doesn't answer the first question. He doesn't answer when. He answers what are the signs. He starts talking about signs, signs, signs. All these things are events at the beginning of birth pangs. Uh, and he's talking about signs, signs, signs. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, signs. These are all signs of the second coming at the end of the tribulation. What are the signs that you see before the Lord Jesus returns in judgment? Then the sign, verse 30, of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all people of the earth, my version says, but literally in Greek, it's the tribes of the land will mourn. That's a reference to Zechariah 12.10. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there is, again, it's taking you all through the signs when Israel finally at the culmination of the tribulation period believes the Lord Jesus returns, the Son of Man returns and establishes his throne. That continues all this discussion of signs through verse 35. Question B. So there's question A. Question B, answer B. It's called chiasm is what this is. Question A, question B, answer B, answer A picks up in verse 36. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only. And then it talks about how the days will be going on just like in the days of Noah. No one thinks anything's going to happen. And then, boom, the rapture will hit. Two uh, men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Uh, two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one left. 
Therefore, be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. It is imminent. It could happen any moment for us. And uh, you have to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's the rapture. That can happen any time. So I would see this as a chiastic structure. It's what is called uh, A-B-B-A. And if we read it that way, then it's, it's clearly a pre-trib rapture about when? We don't know when. It can happen any moment. If it's pre-wrath, then we can look at it. Usually people look at it near the end of the seven years, not in the middle. And okay, we can say, okay, we know when it's going to happen. But this way, the pre-trib rapture makes the most sense. Does that help? Oh, it absolutely does. And the other thing that I so appreciate about you and your ministry is the messianic viewpoint of it all, too, where the whole picture of it um, really, I think the Western culture, America, you know, we, we miss out so much on the Hebrew culture, which is what I like to teach also when it comes to the rapture, mm-hmm. um, how it just ties into it so perfectly, um, you know, how the, the the bridegroom goes to prepare a place and he yeah. comes back at any given moment and we're not aware of the time and the but- bride is to be... Don't you think that's interesting? Not just Matthew 24, but Matthew 25, the, the versions, you have to be ready. It, it kind of fits with exactly. the last part. Exactly. So anyway, right, thank, right. thank you so much for your call, Renee. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to take more of your questions. The phone number, 877-548-3675. Uh, my name is Michael Rydelnik. This program is called Open Line. I'm so glad to be back with you after traveling for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's uh, it's just a joy to be with here with you talking about your questions, having this Bible study across America. Stay with us; more to come right here on Open Line. Welcome back to Open Line. So glad to be with you. My name is Michael Ray Delnick, and it's always great to be with you studying the Scriptures on a, a weekly basis right here every Saturday morning. It's our Saturday morning Bible study uh, all across America. You know, people would always, the people who listen to Open Line are really a distinctive group of listeners, very, very different because Moody Radio listeners all love the Bible, but the Open Line listeners, they want resources that will really help them understand the Bible in a deeper way. And the, that's because the Bible is more than just a collection of ancient texts. It's, it's God's masterpiece of literature, and it's his gift to us. And to help us read it for all it's worth, I'd like to send you our current resource, which is called 14 Fresh Ways to Enjoy the Bible. It's a super helpful book. Moody professor James Coakley wrote it. He's my colleague. He's my friend. He reveals how the same amazing techniques used by modern authors were employed by biblical writers long ago, and they were writing under the superintending of the Holy Spirit. God intended them to use those techniques, and as we read it, we get a fresh lens to understand the Scriptures and to get more out of them. It gives really practical strategies in how to engage God's Word. It gives guidelines Uh, to keep you on track as you read. I think you're going to love this book, and it's yours if you give a gift of any size to Open Line. Uh, Just give a gift, and we want to say thanks by sending you a copy of 14 Fresh Ways to Enjoy the Bible. In fact, uh, Jim will be on with me in a couple weeks uh, to talk about this book. You're going to really love this book. Uh, Anyway, to give your gift, all you have to do is go to openlineradio.org or call 888 644 7122. That's 888-644-7122. And then uh, when you give your gift, remember, ask for 14 fresh ways to enjoy the Bible. And we're going to talk with Pamela in Kissimmee, Florida, listening now on WKES. Welcome to Open Line, Pamela. How can I help you? Yes. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, Luke chapter 5, mm-hmm. verse 14. Okay. And what's your question? And I'm trying, I'm trying to understand what was the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your claim for the cleansing. Oh, I see. Uh, I see. Uh, it says, reaching out his hand, verse thirteen, he touched him, and saying, "I am willing, be made clean." Immediately, the disease, that skin disease, left him. 
But he ordered right. him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what right. Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. That's in the book of Leviticus. There were sacrifices when people were cured of a skin disease. Then they had to go offer a sacrifice. The priests functioned as sort of a, a health examiner and uh, and to see that they were uh, cleansed. Uh, I think that's, that's what he's referring to. It's in, I think it's Leviticus 14, that you have the commands. It begins with skin diseases in chapter 13, and then... Uh, Chapter 14 has the sacrifices that someone is to offer uh, when they get cleansed of the skin disease. Uh, yeah, that's okay. what it is. Leviticus 13 and 14 is where you would read about that. By the way, Le- Leviticus yeah, 13, 40 has my life verse in it. If you want to know Leviticus 13, 40, are you ready to hear it, Pamela? Yes, absolutely. It's, here it is. This is my verse. If a man loses the hair of his head... He is bald, but he is clean. And that's uh, uh, my explanation for uh, I may be bald, but I am clean. There we go. Yeah, so that's clean. Good. Amen. Okay. <laughs> it's not a skin disease. It's just male pattern baldness. That's it. Anyway, thank you for your call, Pamela. We'll talk soon. Uh, Sheldon in Chicago, Illinois, listening on WMBI. Welcome to Open Line. How can I help you? Hello, doctor and family, uh, my uh, Christian family. Um, I'm reading Amos chapter 6. I read through it this morning, but I'm stumped on verse 10, where it says your uncles, will, when it talks about the, the 10 men that will die in the house, just because you have 10 men doesn't mean you're safe, but uh, God is cursing uh, Israel. It's a judgment um, right there. Yeah. It's a judgment. He says, don't speak. He says, hush, don't speak to the other guy in the house uh, lest the Lord curse us or something to that effect. I don't understand that that verse. Let me just tell you, this is why the Moody Bible Commentary is such a helpful resource. I'll read you the words of John Jelenic. He is now with the Lord. He was the academic dean of the Moody Theological Seminary, a uh, wonderful Old Testament scholar, uh, and uh, I had tremendous regard for him. He wrote our commentary on Amos. This is what he says. God's judgment would be such that if 10 men took refuge in one house, they could not preserve their lives. Survivors, understanding that judgment proceeded from God, would not allow the Lord's name to be invoked or to be mentioned, lest that act draw God's attention and result in their deaths as well. God would command the utter destruction of all houses in Samaria, both great and small, and the houses of the rich and poor would perish with them. So that's it. They don't invoke the name of God because they didn't want to attract God's attention and bring further judgment upon them. So uh, I I hope that helps and uh, encourage you. Check out the Moody Bible Commentary uh, when you have a verse you don't understand. It's really very helpful. One of the things that we wanted to do when we did that commentary is Explain the verses that people don't understand and tell us what they mean. So anyway, thanks for your call, Sheldon. And we're going to talk to Bob in Chicago, Illinois, listening on WMBI. Welcome to Open Line, Bob. What can I do for you today? God's blessings, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Where in the Bible can we find God's concept uh, of free will and what is its significance to us, believers? Well... Uh, what I'm not sure. What What are you talking about? I, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm trying to. Guess, what are you getting at? Just free will in general. What? Is, yes, uh, we we discuss. Uh, I can't find it in the commentary. Anything about free will, and it's something that's discussed within the faith uh, with some significance. That uh, that would. Uh, well, okay. Here, here's 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 the conclusion I've always heard. God uh, did or does not force his creations to love him Mm -hmm. or to follow his edicts. Mm -hmm. He doesn't force us. No. We we come to that under under free will. Okay. Making up 
Uh, okay. The well, word, l- l- let me just say that the, the, there are extremes. There's the, the very strong Calvinist that says everything is God's sovereign plan, and and we are uh, almost almost passive. I do believe in God's choice. I believe in predestination. Uh, that God foreknew us, all that. On the other hand, the Bible says that people are responsible to believe. And And as a result uh, of of this, uh, every time the Bible tells people to believe, like Paul talking to uh, the, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is saying that people have a responsibility to believe. Uh, it's human responsibility. They're both true. They are both true. And since they are both true, I have to believe that the, this difficulty of uh, f- uh, what people call free will, I call human responsibility, and then divine sovereignty, they somehow make sense in the mind of God, but I certainly don't. I couldn't give you an explanation. I think that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so uh, much so as in, in that same way are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. That's what God says in Isaiah 55. And one of the more interesting things I see is when it talks about uh, human responsibility, it seems like there's always divine sovereignty linked to it. So, for example, in Philippians 2... It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds like it's a a free will issue, right? But then it says, for it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. So divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Also, uh, in Acts 4.27, a passage about human responsibility for the death of Jesus, it says in verse 27, In fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, there was this whole big conspiracy of Jews and Gentiles conspiring against Jesus, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. So it sounds like there's fully human responsibility for these actions. And then it says, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Divine sovereignty. What's my point? The Bible teaches both usually in verses right next to each other. Uh, That's just how it is. I don't, I can't say that I understand this. Uh, I think that this is an apparent contradiction. An antinomy is what J.I. Packer calls it. Uh, An apparent contradiction, but it's not. It's fully resolved in the mind of God. And I just trust God that, you know, when when he tells me to do something, I'm responsible to respond to it. At the same time, uh, I know that God is the one at work to to accomplish what he wants me to do. Uh, Bob, is that helpful? It is some, yes, it is helpful, Mike, Michael. Uh, but again, when we're, uh, when we're, uh, <laughs> the Lord is leading us, of course, always. But sometimes, you know, it's the old, well, it's the uh, problem. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I don't believe in men, but believe in God and follow him. Mm-hmm. But we have that confusion as we it's, go it's through either, the process. It's, it's not a confusion as long as we trust that it makes sense in the mind of God, that there's God's sovereignty and human responsibility. They're both true, and that's what we have to live with. Anyway, I hope I hope that helps a little bit, Bob. Thanks for your call. We're going to talk to Kevin in Indianapolis, Indiana, listening on WGNR. Welcome to Open Line, Kevin. How can I help you? Well, thank you. Uh, and am I, am I coming through? Is that yeah, end? just is go ahead. Here is the end that matters here. The, uh, my question is, and actually you laid the foundation for it with the previous question. Uh, in Galatians, he uh, Paul is actually famous in calling out the the Jewish believers who brought along, of course, circumcision, but other, uh, maybe not the only one, little side checkpoints that were evidence that you are... Really yeah, well, well, what's your question, God-tastic? Kevin? We're running out of time oh, here. Oh, okay, yeah, my question is, how does one uh, become all things to all people 
as God, as Paul says, that you might win a few and not have certain standards for, okay, this is what the Christian life embodies. I feel like your question, your answer in the previous question, if you're trying to save time, that really answers it. Yeah, well, it make... well let, me, let me just say that the legalists in Galatia were some Jews and maybe even some Gentiles who uh, as, as accepted their idea of circumcision. But Paul actually had Timothy circumcised uh, after the Jerusalem Council. So circumcision for Jewish believers was perfectly okay. The problem was trying to force Gentiles to be circumcised so they had to become Jewish before they believed in Jesus. Uh, Anyway, we'll talk more about this later, Kevin. Thanks for your call. We'll be right back here on Open Line with the FEBC mailbag. Stay with us. And we're back. I'm so grateful that the Far Eastern Broadcasting Company partners with Open Line to bring you the weekly FEBC mailbag. FEBC is a terrific organization, the Far Eastern Broadcasting Company. They bring the good news to people via media, radio, and personal engagement. There's always live people on the ground that will meet with others who are responsive to the good news. And I think it's a wonderful combination of, of personal and, and media interaction. And you can check out the FEBC podcast to learn more about them by listening to Until All Have Heard. Just go to the febc.org website and you can click on their podcast and listen to it there. And many thanks for their participation with us here on Open Line. And now Trisha is yes. joining me. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I bet, you know what? I know I said I wished you had been there. I really did. Mm-hmm. Uh, even I both wished you had been in in uh, Athens and uh, Istanbul. East, well, we didn't go to Istanbul. Oh, we just landed in Istanbul. No, we didn't even go. No? We bypassed okay. it. Oh, we were on a ship, and we went. Uh, our last stop was Pergamum on the ship, and then we went from there to Philippi. Uh, actually, more modern cities, but off off the coast there. So, so if I look in the Bible in the little maps in the back, and I find these cities. Then I can see where you went. Yes. For those Bibles that have, oh, look here, the missionary journeys of Paul. If I follow that, that's kind of what you did. Yep. Okay. That's it. So, but we went uh, from Athens. We started, Paul went to Athens near the end of his journeys, but we started in Athens and saw Athens and Corinth. And we saw of the journeys of Paul, we saw Philippi and Thessaloniki and Thessalonica in biblical parlance, modern Thessaloniki. We saw. Uh, Ephesus. Uh, it was really remarkable. It was great. So so is the Greek that you know any kind of help, or is that a different I, kind of Greek than know, they speak and it, use on signs? Utterly different. Okay. I couldn't understand a word the guides were saying when they talked to each other in Greek. Okay. Or the whatever. But I could read signs, because I know how to read Greek, and and I could understand some of the signs except if they use modern words, but, uh, you know, some of the words are the same, and so I had a good time reading Greek, so, yeah. Dusting that off, no. I've I've seen you translate stuff on the air here, so I know that you are actively using your Greek. But. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's just like modern Hebrew is very different from biblical Hebrew. Yes. So modern Greek is very different from biblical Greek. But there's so. some crossover with oh, yeah. the letters and in the reading. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very cool. Fun. If people are interested and they want to see some photos from that, um, our Facebook, our Open Line Facebook page has um, each day, there's like days. anywhere from like, I don't know, 40 to 60 pictures posted each day from the trip. If you want to see the beautiful, you had some beautiful weather. Yeah, we did. <laughs> if you want to see any of those pictures of the ruins and the different places. That Although they went. we were on a tall ship for six days. Okay. And it was a sail ship, you know, with and 90% of the time it, it didn't use engines. It just used sails. And it got real windy a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last night on the ship, I felt like we were uh, sailing on an angle mm. because of the wind being mm-hmm. so strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a couple of people didn't like that. No, I'm sure that there were some... Stomachs that didn't like that. There were that three as much. or four out mm-hmm. of 160, but a lot of us just sat on the deck looking at 
the stars and mm. the sky and the moon. And it was, it was, I stayed up late. So what was watching. the, what was one place that, that like, like we've talked about how when people travel to Israel, the Bible comes alive mm-hmm. in, in certain aspects. Was there one place that you saw that made um, the Bible, some of the New Testament stuff come alive in a different way? Mm-hmm. You know, you? Uh, I stood at the Bema seat in Corinth. This is an actual, wait, we talk about it in like this yeah. future it's, it's, thing. A Bema seat is a judgment seat. Okay, so they existed before that yeah. Paul was talking yeah. about. Okay. And it's for a first century judgment seat. Okay. And Paul, that was in Corinth. Okay. And Paul uses that as sort of a, you know, the we'll all stand at the judgment seat of, of Messiah one day, 2 Corinthians 5 9, right? 5 10, somewhere around there. But anyway, that's what Paul says that we're going to stand at the judgment seat. And he's using the judgment seat of the. He's writing to the Corinthians. They all know the judgment seat right there in Corinth. And he says, yeah, but there's even a bigger judgment seat. And so it, it's sort of like using what they know to tell about something else that's coming. In 1 Corinthians 3, he talks about the, the judgment that will take place there of our works, whether uh, uh, not the judgment seat in Corinth, but there will be a judgment seat and uh, our works, whether uh, wood, hay, or straw, or gold, silver, and precious gems, they'll be tested by fire. And so... I, I had the great privilege of teaching at the judgment seat there in Corinth, and so so how Paul used that to teach the Corinthians about the future judgment seat, that was kind of a cool thing. Mm-hmm. There are some other places, like uh, in Ephesus, uh, where the, you know you learn all about Artemis, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, and uh, there are proconsuls in place. And you know when when they say, look, they they haven't made any trouble. If you have a complaint, take tells Demetrius, take them. There are proconsuls. Well, there's always one proconsul, not two, and yet he uses a plural. Except, I was reading history and archaeology. I found out that there had been a coup against the proconsul, mm-hmm. the like governor, uh, and was replaced by the two people who had schemed against him. As interim proconsuls, there were two at the time when Paul was there. Huh. And so that was kind of cool to see in Acts 19. It uses the plural because there really were two. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was, oh. I, I had a fun time. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing just a glimpse yeah. of that trip. We missed you. We're glad you're back. Yeah. And now um, people say they want to go again, but I'm too tired to even think about it. Don't don't, don't ask you right now. Yeah, all we'll these wait, people we'll are saying I want to go. I want to go. No, I, I I can't. I got back Wednesday and Thursday. I was back in class and back in the office and back in meetings. So there's and, a little bit of jet lag right now. You're probably feeling all right. Well, it would be I've had, evening. I'm on my fourth cup of coffee of the day, so I'm okay. <laughs> when the coffee stops, I'll I'll stop. So, anyway. Okay. Oh uh, well. I will ask, we'll try and fit in a couple mailbag okay. questions, but thank you for sharing just a glimpse. I know listeners were very excited to hear, you know, highlights and hear, yeah. hear what you saw um, it was great. on the trip. Good. Well, welcome back. Kathleen in Ohio listens to WCRF and wants to know, what does Matthew 6.33 mean when it says to first seek the kingdom of God? What does that actually Well, the look kingdom like? of God is God's rulership. So, you know, we talk about the Messianic kingdom because, and the, that's the kingdom of God because one day when Jesus reigns, the rulership of God will be over all the earth. But uh, the kingdom of God is, for us, it's begun already because Jesus is our king and he's our ruler. So when he says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, what we're doing is we're seeking God's kingdom over our lives, his rulership over our lives and his righteousness, his obedience to him and righteous behavior for him in our lives. That's what he wants of us. So really what it's saying is in every situation we're in, what's our number one priority? What does God want of me here? He is my king. He is my ruler. When I sign off my letters, I copy Eva who started doing this a number of years ago. So it was her idea I said, oh, I'll steal that. Mm-hmm. I sign my letters all for the king. Mm-hmm. Do I mean it? Do I will I do everything that he wants? That's a great reminder for for us. That's what it means to seek his kingdom uh, and his righteousness. 
do I want his rulership in my life? What does he want of me now, right now, today? So then when living our lives, that would come to play in the decisions that we're making. Like if we're choosing to take a job Mm -hmm. or leave a job or um, marry someone or these kinds of things, you know, change churches Mm -hmm. where we're we're seeking his rulership. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll just give you a great example. Uh, A student once came to Eva for advice and she said that she had been offered, she was a comm student here at Moody. You know, she, they're only 18, 19 years old, so don't get too hard on her for what she says. But she was offered an internship to go work on an actual film, mm-hmm. at, at, you know, doing, and, mm-hmm. and she wanted to know if, if it was, how can I know if it's God's will for me to do it? And Eva said, well, tell me about the film. And the film was really bad, okay. uh, uh, virtually pornographic. Okay. And, and so it was not a God honoring film. Yeah. Okay. And Eva said, How is that going to help on that film seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness? And she said, Well, I could learn how to make films. Mm-hmm. And she's that will honor God. And Eva said, Find a different film. Okay. And and to me, that when we make decisions like that, that's and and, and the girl did and everything worked out. Yeah. And it was good. But the the point of it is, uh, that when we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, it should affect every decision we make. It should be a filter that's kind of, that's overlaying everything as we look at it. Yeah, exactly. That, that, and if you do that enough, if you think about that intentionally enough, it should become second nature Yeah. Um, to, to decide or to see that like yeah. God would be honored if I do this. Yeah. Or at least it's not dishonoring God if I what, do this. What what I would like of those who know me well, and I don't know if the, this would ever happen, but I would like people to say, you know what, Michael always wanted to do God's will whenever he made. He didn't always, but he intent his intention was always to do the will of God. That's and that's what I want my intention to be. Uh, I would hope that each of us would want that to be the legacy that we leave because we're seeking His kingdom hmm. first. Yeah. So. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, is there a quick question I can oh. answer so I get at least two in here? Um, sure. Cameron in Illinois listens to WMBI, um, number nine. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> um, as I was reading through Judges 21, I noticed that it made mention that the Israelites went up against Jabesh Gilead as they had not fought against the Benjamites and killed everyone who was not a virgin. My question is, how would they have known who the virgins were in the city? I assume that they wouldn't have asked, but when looking through commentaries, couldn't find the answer. You know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think any of us could know. Uh, maybe they were looking particularly at uh, those who were married or those who were uh, young women who would were, have. Yeah, you know, young young women who were not married would have either been single or immoral. They would have known who the immoral women were. They would have known who the married women are, and I guess that's that's what I think the answer would be. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think they had scarlet letters on them. Right. But, uh, that's that's what I would say. Okay. okay. All right. Thank Good. you. There are some questions like that that we we wonder, and at the same time, I mean, God can make that known too. Yeah. In a way, I don't think that it had it to be known isn't... supernaturally. I yeah. think they would have they would have been there and and known. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Married women were were not virgins. Uh, and then the uh, immoral women were not virgins, and likely, maybe even single women would have been uh, known for that. But I don't know. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for those <laughs> questions, Tricia. And uh, when we come back, we're gonna take more of your calls in just a moment. Uh, so stay with us. Uh, that was the FEBC mailbag. You can always write your question by going to Moody uh, on OpenLineRadio.org. Go to our website. And click on the link that says Ask Michael a Question. And Trish will put your question in, into the mailbag. We're coming right back, so don't go away. This is Michael Radelnik and Trish McMillan on Open Mind. Welcome back to Open Line. I'm Michael Ray Delnick, and I've been having a great time in our Bible study across America. I do want to mention several things. Uh, I had a great time as we traveled, Journeys of Paul, 
Got to meet a lot of Kitchen Table Partners. So grateful for all of you who listen. Grateful for those of you who have become Kitchen Table Partners. And I'm grateful for those of you who will consider becoming Kitchen Table Partners, people who give monthly to Open Line. Pray for Open Line, too. Uh, I, I so appreciate you partnering with us and hope you'll consider doing that. And uh, if you do, if you decide to do that, we will provide you with a Bible study moment every other week. It's an audio Bible study designed exclusively for our kitchen table partners. It shows up in your mail, uh, your email, and you can click on it and listen to it. In order to become a kitchen table partner, call 888-644-7122, 888-644-7122, or go to openlineradio.org. Another thing I need to mention is the Chosen People booklet. It's about the fall feasts of Israel. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Celebrate Israel's High Holidays. Uh, it really will explain the uh, Feast of Trumpets or the Jewish New Year, the Day of Atonement, the, uh, also the Feast of Booths. And the way you can get your copy is go to openlineradio.org and click on the link that says... Uh, uh, a free gift from Chosen People Ministries. So that's where you can get that. And then lastly, I, I want you to go to our webpage, uh, openlineradio.org. We're having a summit here, a one-day conference opposing anti-Semitism. It's a very important uh, day for Christians to come together from all over the country right here at Moody Bible Institute to learn how we can stand with God's people, the Jewish people, his chosen people, and oppose this rising hatred of the Jewish people across the globe, uh, how we can take our responsibility seriously as followers of Jesus to oppose this hatred. Uh, we need to do that. I hope you'll join us November 9th right here at Moody Bible Institute. Check out the link on our webpage, openlineradio.org. We're going to talk with uh, Marsha in Tennessee, WMBW listener. Uh, how can I help you today, Marsha? Hi. Um I was watching a TV show last night about the Gospels, and it was talking about in Matthew that uh, it told the lineage of Joseph. Mm -hmm. But I was, I've always understood that the Jewishness of a person is determined through the mother, and I didn't understand why it was so important to tell the mm -hmm. lineage of Joseph and not the lineage of Mary. Well, let me just say the idea that mat of matrilineal descent for Jewish people is a very late concept. In the Bible, it was not so. Uh, that was because so much anti-Semitism, Jewish women were frequently raped. And as a result of that, it was unknown who the father was. So the rabbis decided to determine Jewishness through the mother rather than the father, and uh, but in the Bible it's either. Um, and the right to the throne of David came by adoption through, Mo through Joseph. That's what Matthew records, because uh, his line is through Solomon. And then uh, through Mary, Luke records Mary's genealogy, and that shows that the Lord Jesus is an actual physical descendant of King David, so he truly is the son of David. And that's why both are given. Uh, Matthew gives Joseph's lineage the right through Solomon, and then uh, Mary's lineage through Nathan shows that he is actually the son of David. So, okay. Thanks for your call, Marsha. Okay. Uh, and uh, Yi Ping in Chicago, Illinois, listening on WMBI, how can I help you today? Hi, good morning. Finally, I got through the line. <laughs> uh, Go ahead with your question. Uh, we're we're yeah, sort of uh, yeah. at the end of the program. Yeah, so. I, yeah. I, I just want to say one thing. Uh, I really appreciate your program. I learned a lot about oh, the Hebrew you. Bible. But I, I only want uh, one question. Uh, in the Ten Commandments, uh, they specifically said about uh, honor our parents. Uh, uh, but not really how to teach our children. Is that because emphasize the relationship, uh, our relationship with God? Well, I'll tell you why I think it is. I think there are other commandments in the law that teach about parental responsibilities. 
Uh, but we often think of the Ten Commandments uh, when it talks about honor your father and mother, that it's referring to little children honoring their parents. I don't, I don't believe that's how the Lord Jesus applied it. He talks about it in Matthew 15 about uh, children, adult children, seeing their aged parents coming and, and avoiding helping them by saying all their uh, goods and wealth is, are devoted to God so they don't have to help their aged parents. And so I think this command, which was given to Israel, to the adults, that even when your parents get old, don't abandon them, don't think, oh, they're such a burden. Rather, honor your parents for what they've done for you and help them and encourage them and support them where you can. Be a strength to your parents when they get old, not uh, someone that don't treat them as if they are a burden. And I think that's what the Ten Commandments is saying when it says honor your father and your mother. Uh, it's not talking about uh, little children. It's really talking about you and me uh, when we come to adulthood to care for, to respect, to honor those parents that gave a lot for us. Uh, I hope that helps, Yiping. Uh There's another time we can talk about what does the Bible say about parents' responsibility to children. Uh, well, that's the program for the week. I can't believe it's over. It's the fastest two hours of the week for me. Thanks for listening, everyone, especially those of you who called uh, or wrote. You make this program possible. Thanks to the Open Line team, Trisha, Ryan, Tahira, uh, Tiara, all of you for making Open Line possible. Keep in touch with us by going to our website, openlineradio.org. It's got all the links you're looking for there. Keep reading the Bible, and we'll talk about it next week. Open Line with Dr. Michael Radelnik is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Have a great day and see you next week.